Hi, this is Dr. Roy Herbst from the Yale Cancer Center, Smile Cancer Hospital. And my role as the chair of the Tobacco uh, Subcommittee of the AACR Policy Committee, it's my pleasure to um, lead us through today this webinar looking at tobacco and cancer science policy, e-cigarettes, research, public health concerns, and opportunities and regulations. This is an encore uh, performance from um, some of the presentations that we did at the AACR annual meeting uh, just this last April in New Orleans. Well, this is such an important uh, uh, topic that the AACR has, the Tobacco and Cancer Subcommittee. Uh, we have a history now of over six years, um, almost seven, uh, and we've published a number of uh, uh, policy statements as shown on this slide. In 2010, uh, we, we, as a group, we uh, submitted a statement, Tobacco and Cancer, uh, an American Association of Cancer Research Policy Statement, look at tobacco cigarettes and some of the issues uh, related to uh, their their regulation and 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 the need for uh, increased smoking cessation uh, smoking is involved in over 18 different types of uh, cancer causation and then in 2013 we updated this uh, and we actually focused on uh, smoking cessation in cancer patients who are receiving therapy and this is assessing uh, tobacco use by cancer patients and facilitating cessation, and this is a policy statement as well. And you see the references, and they're both available online. Well, um, the world has changed, and um, you know, um, and uh, in uh, the last several years, there's been a boom in in the use of these e-cigarettes, um, ENDS, uh, E-N-D-S, electronic nicotine delivery systems. So, working uh, in very close cooperation with the American uh, Society of Clinical Oncology the AACR, the American Association for Cancer Research, released this joint statement uh, in the early part of 2005, published in uh, both Clinical Cancer Research and Journal of Clinical Oncology, Electronic Nicotine Delivery Systems, a policy statement from uh, both societies. This was quite timely because e-cigarette use, uh, especially in, in, in youth, uh, is, is becoming uh, a major issue, uh, and we wanted to address early on uh, some of the uh, health concerns that could uh, be uh, associated with these and also discuss regulatory and policy issues. Well, uh, here's a bit of an overview of what we'll discuss in this program, e-cigarettes policy and research. Um, we made more than 13 recommendations, the AACR ASCO Joint Policy Commission, uh, regarding the regulation, the sales, use, and research considerations for electronic cigarettes. We are very supportive of the now uh, approved FDA deeming regulation um, that needs to be extended to all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, and, and made the case that the enforcement for youth restrictions and rigorous scientific review of new tobacco products and the claims to reduce tobacco-related disease and death uh, uh, be um, put under uh, increased scrutiny. And of course, um, the deeming regulation uh, has begun this process. ENDS research is still ongoing to understand the public health impact and potential benefits uh, of e-cigarettes. We need to explore the composition of the e-liquid, inhaled aerosol of the user, the secondhand exposure of these agents. We need to explore the promotion and marketing of ENDS to the youth population, the use of flavorings to attract um, youth especially to using these devices, and the issue that there's insufficient evidence to support uh, using these as smoking cessation devices. NCCN guidelines uh, do not recommend ENDS uh, for cessation. And this is a committee that Dr. Shields and I uh, co-chair. Well, um, what, what, what more? Uh, the FDA has in part begun to make progress uh, uh, in the areas of the AACR ASCO recommendation areas, though the newly released, released deeming regulations and rules um, do require, in our opinion, more work to be done. Now, it's the opinion of our committee, uh, and we just recently met uh, uh, several months ago, that the FDA and, and uh, Center for Tobacco Products should regulate all ends that meet the statutory definition of tobacco products. Ends that do not meet this uh, definition should be regulated by the FDA through other appropriate authorities. We believe that the manufacturers of these e-cigarettes ends should be required to register with the FDA and report all product and ingredient listings as well as the nicotine concentration to the, uh, in the end solution. 
We believe there needs to be development of regulation standards for ENDS, which should include international cooperation. This is a worldwide problem. And all data related to ENDS composition, use, and health effects should be disclosed for dissemination and should inform policy decisions for ENDS product regulation. It was the belief that ENDS use should be prohibited in places where combustible tobacco product use is prohibited by federal, state, or local law until the safety of secondhand aerosol exposure is established. There are no data on this right now. ENDS packaging and advertising should be required to carry safety labels that include a warning regarding nicotine addiction. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances uh, available, and um, uh, people are becoming addicted to nicotine with these products. And funding generated through tobacco product taxes, including any potential taxes levied on ENDS, should be used to help support research on ENDS and other tobacco products, and should not preclude the allocation of federal funding for this research. What about recommendations regarding youth and young adults? It's our belief that all youth-oriented ENDS advertising and marketing should be prohibited. Internet and other mail order sellers of ENDS should be required to check the age and identification of customers at the point of purchase and delivery. Childproof, childproof caps should be required for all e-liquid containers. These could become a, a poisoning issue if, if it's getting into someone uh, uh, who doesn't understand uh, their, what, what it is, a young child. Ends and ends liquid containing candy and other youth-friendly, youth-oriented flavors should be banned unless there is evidence demonstrating these products do not encourage youth uptake. So that's a concern that many of these flavors, cotton candy, uh, uh, for example, uh, are appealing to youth. And state and local governments should implement ENDS regulations appropriate for protecting the public health, including restricting the sale, distribution, marketing, and advertising of ENDS to youth. Well, you know, all of, of these recommendations, um, as, 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 as things work through the FDA, require research. So um, this is a list of research considerations for electronic cigarettes for ENDS. Additional research is clearly needed including assessing health impacts and use patterns and the role of ENDS in cessation. If one wants to make the claim that ENDS work in cessation, then let's look for evidence for that. We need uh, research uh, into the design features of ENDS and how the various designs correlate with the health risks and abuse liability. Research into the health effects of acute and chronic ENDS product use. We have to explore the risks and benefits of transitioning from combustible smoking to using ENDS. The use patterns in youth, young adults, cancer patients, and survivors. The effects of flavoring on the appeal and use of ENDS. The impact and influence of marketing and availability on the perception and use of ENDS and other tobacco products. The impact of tobacco control policies on the use of ENDS. And finally, the potential benefits or harm in the use of ENDS for cessation, especially in cancer patients. There are many claims that are being made out there. There needs to be data to support or refute them. So um, we're going to provide uh, in today's webinar um, a real comprehensive um, uh, discussion of these issues with um, four experts uh, in the field. Um, you'll first hear from Peter Shields, Professor of Internal Medicine and the College of Medicine and Deputy Director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Shields is the Deputy Director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and an internationally renowned physician scientist and expert in cancer prevention. He was recently named the President of the American Society of Preventive Oncology. Shields is a leader in researching new biomarkers of cancer risk, molecular epidemiology, and carcinogenesis. His primary focus is identifying biomarkers that can be used in the clinic to assess breast and lung cancer risk particularly those related to diet, smoking, and lifestyle. You'll next hear from Dr. Benjamin Toll, um, Associate Professor of Public Health Science, Chief of Tobacco Cessation and Health Behaviors at the Hollings Cancer Center, Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Toll is the Chief of Tobacco Cessation and Health Behaviors in the Hollings Cancer Center of the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Toll is a clinical psychologist with a research focus on cancer control 
and testing novel smoking cessation treatments. He has tested several pharmacological and counseling interventions and has expertise in the measurement of tobacco use and tobacco-related syndromes. Dr. Toll has written national policy statements as a member of several national organizations, including the AACR Tobacco and Cancer Subcommittee. He's also my former colleague here at Yale, and he works very closely with us on the lung spore at Yale, uh, looking at smoking cessation methods. Next, you'll hear from Dr. Brian King, Deputy Director of Research uh, Translation, Office on Smoking and Health, at the NCCDPHP Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Brian King is the Deputy Director for Research Translation in the Office on Smoking and Health within the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this capacity, he's responsible for providing scientific leadership and technical expertise related to multiple aspects of tobacco prevention and control. And finally, you'll hear from Jerry Voss. Ms. Voss serves at the FDA Center for Tobacco Products as a senior regulatory counsel with a focus on the FDA's regulation of tobacco products, particularly the recently released deeming rule to extend the agency's authority to regulate all currently unregulated tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. This extended authority was given to the FDA under the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. Ms. Voss is a graduate of the American University Washington College of Law. So as you can see, we've put together a, a wonderful group of speakers today to address many of the issues that I just uh, briefly introduced in a very critically important area for all citizens of the United States and the world, given the, the risks of tobacco and, and, and the, the cancers and heart disease that uh, can be the result of it, and of course the unknown risks uh, of these uh, emerging e-cigarette uh, uh, devices. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Dr. Peter Shields. Hello. I'm Dr. Peter Shields. I'm going to give you an overview of electronic cigarettes. I'm from the James Cancer Hospital, Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I'm doing this on behalf of the American Association for Cancer Research. So first of all, I have no financial disclosures related to electronic cigarettes. The topics that I will discuss um, are into these four baskets. What are, le are, what are electronic cigarettes and what is up with these? I'm going to talk about prevalence, including the marketing and challenges about how we see these prevalences in both adults and kids. Efficacy, which cannot be directly tested in the U.S., and I'm there, I'm talking about smoking cessation. And then safety and confusion about how to predict risk. So I will go through each of these. First of all, there's so many different types of electronic cigarettes, vapes, hookahs, um, lots of different names, different styles, uh, some of tank systems with more than 4,000 available flavors. So unfortunately, when we talk about a study about electronic cigarettes, we're really talking about a study about that electronic cigarettes. And at this point in time, it's very hard to generalize to all these sort of electronic nicotine delivery systems that are out there. But we're doing the best we can and trying to learn as fast as we can. So what is in these electronic cigarettes? Basically, they are nicotine delivery devices. And by the way, so when I talk about an e-cig or an ENZ, I'm really talking about the full spectrum of products that are out there that are delivering nicotine. They uh, contain carriers for the nicotine, which is propylene glycol and glycerin and some proportion as for the two of them, so that this is, can become vaporized carrying the nicotine. The propylene glycol and glycerin are generally regarded as safe by the Food and Drug Administration, but that is for putting it in foods and in cosmetics. We have no idea, as I'll come back to, what these products or these chemicals might do when they're inhaled in the lungs. The electronic cigarettes include flavors, of which uh, some products you have to buy the flavors that are available, and other products you can mix whatever flavors you want. And these things are battery powered. So with electric currents applied to the propylene glycol and glycerin, you get nicotine um, vaporizing and you're able to inhale that. So what are the major issues and research questions about electronic cigarettes? Well, first of all, it depends on your perspective. What are the risks to adolescents and young adults? Well, some people worry that these may be a gateway. So if you have a kid uh, who's using electronic cigarettes, they may 
become addicted to nicotine and find better ways of delivering or getting their nicotine and may transition to cigarettes. It's hypothetical at this point. Normalization, are we still glorifying the use of tobacco or inhaling things into lungs? And so that's another concern. Some look at this product as a harm reduction product, where if someone will use an electronic cigarette who's an established smoker and they smoke less cigarettes, is smoking less better than uh, smoking more? With oh, very open research questions about how much less you need to smoke for there to be a uh, health benefit, this is also theoretical. And then lastly, does the use of electronic cigarettes promote smoking cessation? Um, this is also uh, theoretical right now. We have studies in progress. Early studies, as I'll show you, are, have some promise. Um, there could be some hope. There's nothing we would like more in tobacco control than another methodology to get people to quit smoking. Um, and maybe as electronic cigarettes, but we're waiting for those studies to be done. Parenthetically, the challenge that we have in the United States uh, at the current time is that to test an electronic cigarette for smoking cessation requires special approval for the FDA, which is not possible at this point because you need all sorts of safety data, manufacturing data, and that sort of thing, which is not available for commercial electronic cigarettes. There are companies um, and the federal government trying to get around this, as soon as they get around to it, trying to address this by having um, products made that the FDA will approve for smoking cessation, but they don't exist today. So any studies we're going to have about smoking cessation that are designed for smoking cessation will be done outside this country. So important principles and notes. Whenever we're talking about electronic cigarettes and, and the ilk, we have to think about tobacco control generally, and we know that tobacco control works. That things like, like taxes, education, uh, a number of different uh, ways that um, uh, we control tobacco use, uh, cessation products that work, tobacco control clearly works and we shouldn't forget about that. The next most important principle is that tobacco control works. The next most important principle is that tobacco control works. You're seeing a trend here. We can't lose sight of this. Um, but tobacco control works, but it's really still not good enough because we have too many kids starting to smoke and we have too many adults who continue to smoke and can't quit. So I just want to have a call out to a report that was just released as a recommendation to the National Cancer Institute um, by a working group led by Robin Mermelstein and Mike Fior uh, proposing tobacco control research priorities for the next decade. And they had a very interesting graphic in there showing that the percent of um, the population who is smoking is continually declining through 2015 with a projected line down to 2050, a long time. But of course, if we got it to zero by 2015, we would take that. But the question is, is can we do this quicker? And whether or not this is just wishful thinking. Um, there's a lot of people who believe that electronic cigarettes might be the answer to this um, to accelerate the process. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So it's very controversial. So in 2015, Public Health England, which is their equivalent of their Department of Health and Human Services, came out with this report that they called an evidence update. And they said basically, in a nutshell, best estimates show e-cigs are 95% less harmful to your health than normal cigarettes. And when supported by a smoking cessation service, it helps smokers to quit tobacco altogether. It's interesting because they have the same data that we have here on this side of of the Atlantic Ocean, and we have substantial concerns, and, and our public health agencies here are not willing to go to that extreme. Um, and in fact, this has created a lot of controversy um, because you have a major health organization promoting the use of electronic cigarettes by what a lot of us think is, is uh, insufficient evidence. Um, so here was a, uh, an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine published in April 2016. Uh, and one of the quotes that I will um, show with, share with you is that it said the dominant policy perspective of the United States serves as a foil to the one embraced in England, so we're diametrically opposed, with a tight focus on potential risk to children and non-smokers, e-cigarettes are out of the question. And unfortunately, like, like many debates, people tend to be um, on one extreme or the other, and so what's happening is that people are so worried about kids and non-smokers who are uptaking e-cigs that they may be losing sight of the potential for smoking cessation, whereas the opposite happens too, where there are some individuals who believe that this is um, uh, such an important device to get people to quit that, uh, that they forget about the kids and non-smokers or minimize the impact on them. 
And so there have been numerous, numerous editorials pro and, and con. And so what are we saying, for example, we in the uh, American Association of Cancer Research, American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Heart Association, uh, et cetera, and basically we want to see evidence. We can't endorse something at this point without evidence. We can't say that it's um, a, a dangerous route without evidence. Um, we believe in the hope and we believe in tobacco control and hopefully these things will work out. So the idea is that these products are on the market, they're being sold leg legally. In the U.S. now they're going to be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration as of um, uh, this week. Um, but and, and until we really have some evidence, um, we can't make a specific statement yes or no, but rather we understand that people are using electronic cigarettes and we're going to work with them to try to uh, to quit, to stay away from cigarettes, um, and address the issues that are important among kids uh, like flavors and packaging and marketing. So I want to call out to a paper that was published a few months ago by David Levy and co-workers, uh, a very, very interesting paper on a framework for evaluating the public health impact of e-cigarettes and, and other vaporized nicotine products. And they made some very interesting <coughs> um, uh, observations uh, for their framework, and then they actually show how complex all of this is and how e-cigs in some ways gets very politicized based on which tract you're most worried about. But they said, well, what if in this world that um, electronic cigarettes have a mortality risk similar to smokeless tobacco? Some would argue that it would be more, some that is argued uh, less, but it's based on basically uh, biomarker studies. Um, they said that if someone will use electronic cigarettes and reduce their cigarette smoking, the amount of harm reduction, if any, will depend on how much you use and how old they are. Um, they recognize that the products that are on the market now and the studies are still in their infancy. And they also state that the regulation of e-cigs and cigarettes as products are, are complex and it really should be done in a complex environment. We shouldn't talk about just e-cigs or cigarettes, but understand that we're driving tobacco users from one product to another, and we need to have the balance between not stifling innovation, but also protecting people. And then they said that there should be marketing regulation to avoid smoking renormalization. And what I want to show you is they have all these algorithms. They say, what if you start with a never smoker, who in the absence of electronic cigarettes would become a smoker, and so if they never use electronic cigarettes, they become a long-term smoker, but what if they did use it? And some of them just continue to use it. Some of them will be a long-term electronic cigarette smoker, arguably safer than cigarettes, or maybe they become dual users. And there are all these different algorithms. So this is for never smokers. This is for current smokers. This is for former smokers. And depending on what you think is the most important public health issues for these outcomes, you're going to see electronic cigarettes very differently. So what's happening in the real world? So this is from um, April 2016 for high school students. We know that kids, or at least high school students, are, are trying electronic cigarettes in much higher numbers than in cigarettes. Electronic cigarettes use are going up, cigarettes are going down, um, and a lot of these are, or most of these are, are, are high school students who have never used cigarettes before. And so that's got a real concern. Some would argue that this decrease in cigarette use is because of electronic cigarettes going up so that, so that kids are not using the more harmful combustion type products. Others would argue that this was a natural trend because of our good tobacco control efforts. This is just a coincidence or a concern that's going to stop this downward trend, level it off, and we're going to start seeing cigarette use go up again. So we're all sort of predicting the future. I don't think that anyone would argue against um, closely marketing, educating students, um, that sort of thing, trying to avoid a nicotine addiction in them. Um, but these are, are clearly trends um, that need to be addressed. In the adult population, so this is also just published a few months ago, um, and so here you're seeing electronic nicotine delivery systems, who's aware, who ever used, and who's the past 30 days. So among current smokers, almost 90% of them are aware about e-cigs. More than half have ever tried one. I'd have to say with my patients it may be even higher than that. I bet this is 2014 data is probably um, higher than even 51%. And past 
30-day use is 21%. Some of these people are doing this to try to quit, but a lot of these people are doing this just to try to get away from indoor air laws. And so they're trying to use it um, in places where um, they wouldn't allow to smoke, and that's got concern because maybe these people would otherwise quit. Um, or they're going to continue their smoking habits in a way that they're going to have the same toxicity even though they think they may be reducing it by sometimes using an electronic cigarette. And then we have the never smokers. So most never smokers, 92, almost 93 percent are aware of e-cigs. Ever used is almost 5 percent, past 30 day use is 1 percent. These numbers are growing. Question is, is these are people who are never smokers. If they're now inhaling something that's potentially hot toxic and, and hurting themselves, the question is how much? We don't know if there's any harm, but if there is, this is something we have to work out so that they can be informed and decide whether they want to use these products. We obviously use other things like, like alcohol or driving cars that are potentially um, harmful to us, and we make those choices. Right now, there's no data for a never smoker about how much risk they're having. And I've seen things in the literature that range from electronic cigarettes being as risky as cigarettes to electronic cigarettes to having no risk. Um, obviously, both extremes are, are unlikely to be true, at least in my mind. What's driving a lot of this, of course, is, is the media. Um, so these are considered very um, appealing project, uh, products in many ways. Um, but also the industry is fueling this, and, and of course the internet blogs. So this is from a paper that was published this year from Tobacco Regulatory Science by Liz Klein and Micah Berman and others. And they did an internet um, survey of different companies that are selling or marketing or distributing electronic cigarettes. And you see things like uh, the statement is the realistic experience of smoking without the serious health issues associated with tobacco cigarettes. You won't inhale any of the carcinogens or other harmful components found in smoking. Why cause more health issues with smoking a cigarette just to get the nicotine addiction when you're able to get the nicotine with our product without having to worry about more health issues when smoking a cigarette? have helped 85% of the people to stop smoking, you know, sort of a very crazy um, uh, uh, claim. Uh, at this point in time, these claims are, are, are not going to be allowed by the FDA, but of course if these claims get put up by some website um, in the middle of a foreign country, um, then FDA is not going to be able to reach them. And so all of these are fueling the use of electronic cigarettes. Um, this paper I'm just calling out to, uh, published by Steinberg and co-workers um, in Preventive Medicine Reports, have been surveying primary care physicians. At least uh, more than half of them are being asked by their patients about electronic cigarettes, and they're actually endor and about a third of them are endorsing electronic cigarettes. When we at the ACR and, and, and other associations say that this is not the time to be endorsing anything until we have some data. And we're not putting our, our heads in the sand as sometimes we're accused because this data is ongoing. And we should find out pretty quickly because there's a lot of different studies going on around the world to address the issues around electronic cigarettes. This is a high priority for the tobacco control community. Um, some of the things that we've noticed, uh, this is a paper that was also published this year um, in that they've tested a number of different electronic cigarettes. They all work differently. Only one out of the 10 brands were within 10% of reported yields. Um, and the same brand purchased at different times behave differently. This is one of the reasons why the FDA needs to regulate these products um, so that they are safe, they don't have batteries blowing up, that they're delivering what they claim, uh, they're delivering in their marketing. We do know that um, the propylene glycol and the glycerin will break down to potentially toxic materials like formaldehyde, acid aldehyde, and choline. A lot of that is dependent on the voltage. So the higher the voltage, um, the more of these uh, toxins come out. Whether or not these toxins are high enough to cause a problem or not remains to be determined. This has not been directly tested in humans, except that we know that people who use electronic cigarettes in clinical trials um, may initially feel some irritant effects and then they adapt to it. So, so if these are there, the question is they're, they're probably not high enough to actually be causing clinical symptoms, but nonetheless the FDA could be looking at data like this and limiting the amount of voltage um, that's allowed for electronic cigarette. There are other studies that report low levels of tobacco-specific nitrosamines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, volatile organic carbonyls, and, um, or compounds rather, and heavy metals. These are their extremely low levels, tiny compared to cigarettes. Um, but depending on where you stand 
any exposures are considered to be really, really, really bad, and other people think if this is tiny compared to cigarettes, then that might be progress. Um, you see uh, papers here, this was published a year ago about the hidden formaldehyde in e-cigarette aerosols. Um, this is based on, quite frankly, not particularly good quality data, but it's hitting things like the, the New England Journal of Medicine because we're all so desperate for data. And they wrote that this risk from the e-cigs, from the formaldehyde, is five times as high as compared to the risk estimate based on the calculation of this publication, or even 15 times as high based on this other calculation as the risk associated with long-term smoking. I will tell you that this is highly unlikely um, and was just, just bad science. Um, and sometimes bad science does get into um, good journals, but if there is a risk based on everything that I've seen, it's, it's, it's not um, uh, certainly not more than cigarettes and likely substantially less than cigarettes. Um, here's another one I was looking at the uh, flavors and the aerosols of these inhaled toxins and it took a little bit more of a balance but in this study they were finding this diacetyl and acetyl propanol um, which is this thing that causes these popcorn lungs um, uh, from occupational studies and they said were found in large proportion of sweet flavored electronic cigarette liquids with many of them exposing users to higher than safety levels. Their presence in the EC liquids represents an avoidable risk. Proper measures should be taken by EC liquid manufacturers and flavoring suppliers to eliminate these hazards from the products without necessarily limiting the availability of sweet flavors. This whole thing about popcorn lung um, and the levels that workplace or workers are exposed to are substantially different than what you'll get from electronic cigarettes. Nonetheless, the FDA could decide from a uh, protection and safety point of view that these flavors just aren't needed or they could be changed in some way so that you don't get these compounds. Um, but again, this is the type of stuff that hits the media um, and tends to um, get a lot of uh, press. There is a lot of research going on. I'm not going through these. I'm trying to understand the biological effects of electronic cigarettes. Um, the number of publications are, are increasing dramatically, and hopefully we'll have a clearer picture in, in, in a couple of years. Um, that sounds like a long time to folks, but that's really a lightning speed for science. Um, you know, this is just to, just to remind me to point out that, you know, look, these e-cigs are nicotine delivery devices. People, when they use them, will inhale. Um, there are some open questions about whether nicotine itself um, is a potential carcinogen or bad. Um, I've written editorials and, as well as others. Um, nicotine theoretically uh, can promote cancers based on laboratory studies. The human evidence is really not there. Um, and if I had a choice of someone being on a long-term nicotine replacement therapy or an e-cig um, versus going back to smoking, I would choose the former. Um, you know, what we really need is clinical trials like this, not necessarily laboratory studies about what's coming out of electronic cigarette. So here's a study that was recently published on 111 smokers provided e-cigs. 16 of them were able to quit with their e-cigs and 17 remained dual users using their cigarettes and e-cigs. They all maintain their nicotine level, but, but in, the, um, uh, in the groups that were using the e-cigs, their carbon monoxide and 3-HPMA, one of the carcinogen metabolites, were decreased in both groups by a lot. So there was some evidence here that at least e-cigs would reduce exposures. Um, I'm not going to go through these studies, but we only have a handful of smoking cessation reduction randomized studies. Um, more coming out all the time, um, with as recently as just a, a couple of months ago, um, but all still small studies. Um, but the bottom line is, is that there is some um, effect of e-cigs on helping reduction and cessation. Um, none of these would ever amount to sufficient evidence um, for rigorous science, um, but at least they're headed in the right direction. So let me just sum up the major issues and research questions of electronic cigarettes. We're worried about whether there's a gateway effect as risk to adolescence. Harm reduction, we know that biomarker levels go down to levels of smokeless users, um, but that doesn't mean that there's no effects and there won't be effects for either former or never smokers. Does it promote smoking cessation? The early data is positive, but the trial data is lacking um, and it's not clear how good they are at this point. Um, and we have to remember, as I pointed out, tobacco control works. So we have to regulate these products as well as cigarette products in the, in the context of a complex tobacco product market. And the last thing I'll just mention is that um, last year we published guidelines for smoking cessation for patients with cancer. So there are algorithms on how to, patients, how to get patients to smoke, getting patients to stop smoking 
whatever their stage is, um, is considered to have the health benefits, and in there, um, there are specific um, discussions of electronic cigarette use um, and, and, and um, how to approach a patient who's using electronic cigarettes. So I'll uh, stop there and, and say thanks for listening. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Benjamin Toll. Hi, my name is Benjamin Toll. I am here to speak with you about e-cigarettes and clinical treatment. I want to thank the AER for having me do this presentation. Um, of course, I need to start with my disclosures. I received a grant from Pfizer for over $10,000 for medicine only. I will not be talking about this grant in this presentation. So for the presentation today, my plan is to provide data on use of e-cigarettes, including use by cancer patients, and to give counsel concerning how to address questions from your cancer patients about the use of e-cigarettes. So just a few definitions to start off with. I'm going to use interchangeably the terms e-cigarette, nicotine vaporizer, and ENDS, or elect electronic nicotine delivery system. So vaping is a term very similar to smoking. Vaping means that you're inhaling vapor from an e-cigarette. So this is a picture of a second generation e-cigarette. As you can see, there's a tank on the front that is transparent that's being filled with this nicotine fluid that's often called juice. So here is a person actually vaping. And as you can see, there's usually a button that's being pushed. If you push that button, the top part, the, the, the bottom part rather, that's long and black is the battery. Um, and um, there's a heating element in the middle that's going to heat the juice. And then there is vapor coming through uh, that is inhaled by your patient and, uh, quote, vaped. So prevalence in the general public for e-cigarette use, there's less than 2% of e-cigarettes are used every day or some days compared with close to 20% for smoking. Approximately 20 to 35 percent of current smokers have tried e-cigarettes. For prevalence in cancer patients, there's very little prevalence, frankly. Um, there's one study that analyzed e-cigarette use among cancer patients attending the smoking cessation program. From that study, approximately 10 percent had used e-cigarettes in 2012, and a little over a third, 38.5 percent had used in 2013. So there, for, for, from my perspective, there are three sources of information to guide your discussions with patients. There's the IASLC statement that was published in JTO in 2014. There's uh, our statement from both AACR and ASCO that was published in Clinical Cancer Research and the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2015. And then there are the NCCN guidelines from 2015. I'm planning to go through all of these. This is a screenshot of uh, those three papers I just mentioned. Um, and this is a screenshot of the, of the the first page of the NCCN guidelines. Um, and I would encourage you to read all three of these documents. For the NCCN guidance, they essentially say there's currently insufficient evidence to support use of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation for cancer patients. They encourage patients to use evidence-based methods. Um, it's an important point to note that from their guidance, prior unsuccessful attempts, um, perhaps with a clearly evidence-based method like the the nicotine patch, if you are not if you're not successful 
and that type of attempt, it does not justify the use of an alternative method like e-cigarettes that's not been proven to work. They also state correctly that relapse and slips back to smoking are common. So it may be, it's important to be clear that uh, generally people who smoke need to try several times to quit smoking. Next is the ACR and the ASCO guidance. So we strongly encourage healthcare providers to provide or to, to refer patients who use tobacco, including cancer patients, to an evidence-based treatment program and to recommend use of FDA-approved cessation methods. These are methods that are um, either the, the nicotine products, those are primarily the patch gum and the lozenge, although you can get the inhaler and the nasal spray by prescription. It is bupropion or Zyban and, and varenicline or Chantix. Next point from our perspective at the ACR and ASCO is that given the overall lack of evidence that's to support the use of ENDS as a proven quit smoking aid for smokers in general, and the absence of any data on potential adverse effects of inhaling aerosol by patients with cancer who are undergoing treatment, oncologists would be wise to refrain from recommending ENDS to patients as a first-line therapy for smoking cessation. Now I'd like to, to go through um, the uh, uh, both the IASLC guidance and clinical scenarios. So IASLC counsels to one, tell your patients to stop smoking cigarettes right away. Two, tell your patients that you are willing and that you want to work with them to help them overcome their tobacco dependence. The treatment guidelines for uh, tobacco use and dependence are a good starting point to identify evidence-based options for smoking cessation. It's important that you explain to your patient that the safety and effectiveness of e-cigarettes are not totally understood, nor is there evidence to suggest that e-cigarettes are clearly, are clearly safer or more effective than existing FDA-approved stop smoking medications. So there are several clinical scenarios and I just want to start by stating I think it's important to be thoughtful when speaking with patients. There's truly not a one-size-fits-all and that's why um, I'm going to go through several clinical scenarios to give you some guidance. So the first scenario is a patient that, who has recently stopped smoking and they've used method and they've used methods other than an e-cigarette, first, it's crucial that you congratulate that patient for stopping smoking and discuss long-term use of pharmacotherapy. There's emerging evidence that long-term use of nicotine therapy up to six months is shown to be more effective than shorter courses of these medications. And this may be especially important in light of intensive cancer treatment. So cancer treatment may take quite some time um, and it's important that you give your patients the amount of NRT or medication that is going to benefit them. Generally, uh, based on the emerging evidence, we suggest six months. The next scenario is a patient that's recently stopped smoking but states that they're using an e-cigarette to refrain from smoking. 
Again, it's very important that you congratulate that patient for stopping smoking. Encourage them to wean off of the cigarette. Talk with them about the lack of long-term safety data. An option is to try to use a first-line therapy to switch to. So it's possible that a patient may come in and they're using a cigarette and they tell you, Doc, I'm so happy because I've quit smoking. Now I'm using this product. So it's important that you congratulate them and then explain that while you would be okay with them taking the, the patch for quite some time, it's important that they switch off of the e-cigarette because it's not clear what the safety data is. There's some emerging safety data that does not look great. Um, it may be that the patient has difficulty and does not want to give up the e-cigarette, but I would strongly encourage you to work with this patient to try to switch them to a drug like nicotine patch that has that has literally decades of clear safety data that shows it's a very safe product and is clearly less harmful than smoking. Next is a scenario in which the patient is still smoking but they're interested in stopping. So for this scenario, you want to congratulate the patient on being willing to stop. There are several things that you can do from here. The first is your medical center or practice may have a dedicated treatment program or a smoking or, or a smoking treatment expert that you can refer them to. The next is to send them to a quit line. In all 50 states in this country, you can call the phone number 1-800-QUIT-NOW and be connected to a tobacco treatment specialist who will help your patient by providing generally at least one counseling session by phone and in many states, free medications. Next, and this is really important, is that you as their provider give them advice that quitting smoking is going to help them. It's going to help both their cancer treatment and it's going to help their overall health. And that you prescribe pharmacotherapy. Generally, these medications are very safe. There was a concern about bupropion and varenicline that I believe has been clearly mitigated by the EAGLES trial that came out in the Lancet in June. There is very clear evidence from this trial that these are very safe medications, so there's really no risk in prescribing either a type of NRT, that is the nicotine patch, the nicotine gum, or the nicotine lozenge, or bupropion or varenicline. Um, and last, and I can't stress this enough, it's essential that you take ownership of the patient's quitting process. That means that you both start with advising them to quit smoking and prescribing pharmacotherapy, and at your multiple follow-up sessions that you continue to follow up and ask them how it's going and to continue to encourage them to quit smoking. In this scenario, it's important that you do not advise use of the cigarette for quitting smoking. The next scenario and our final scenario is the patient continues to smoke and is not interested in stopping. Here, it's incredibly important that you give advice for them to stop smoking. You, as their, as their provider or their physician, are a very powerful force in their life. And I've met with many patients who had not wanted to quit smoking 
And when their oncologist told them it's going to benefit them, they changed their tunes. So you have a lot of power in this type of a scenario, and it's important that you, as their oncology provider, encourage them to stop smoking um, with both advice that it's going to help their cancer treatment and their overall health, and to prescribe an evidence-based pharmacotherapy. Throughout oncology treatment, they will be seeing you several times, so it's important that you continue to raise their smoking and continue to provide counsel that it's helpful for them to try to quit smoking and that it may take several times of them trying. Um, access to, to free nicotine medication is clearly warranted here. There is good evidence from uh, Drs. Carpenter and Hughes that if you give a, a sample of medications and just ask patients to try them, that that may be a pathway to them eventually trying to, to quit and eventually quitting smoking. Again, in this scenario, it's important that you do not advise use of the e-cigarette. It's now my pleasure to introduce Brian King. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, patterns of electronic nicotine delivery system use and the implications for, for public health practice. And I'll talk specifically about use among youth and adults, as well as what this uh, information means in terms of the long-term uh, uh, individual and population level health impact of these products. And so before I start, I'll just give my disclosures. I have no financial relationships to disclose, and I also will not discuss any off-label use and or investigational use of uh, products in my presentation. And I'll also give a standard disclaimer uh, that the findings and conclusions in this presentation are, are those uh, of uh, myself and not necessarily the official position of, of the CDC. So we'll start in terms of the, the uh, landscape of these products. Uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems uh, first entered the U.S. marketplace in 2007, um, and we've seen a, a diversification of that landscape to include a broad variety of different terms. Um, electronic nicotine delivery system is the broader uh, term that's used to describe the, the diversity of the class, which can include e-cigarettes, hookah pens, e-cigars, vape pens, e-pipes, and e-hookahs. Um, and we've also seen some evidence that there's some uh, regional variation in terms of what people call these products, uh, particularly among youth. And so this is important for a variety of reasons, not just in terms of surveillance, because we want to make sure that the questions um, that we're asking are, are appropriate and relevant to the users and they identify with those terms, but also in terms of policy and ensuring that policies address the, the broad diversity of these products, including those who uh, include both nicotine or non-nicotine um, to ensure that there's no loopholes in existing uh, regulations and policies related to these products. Uh, so in terms of the product landscape, I'll start first with adults. Um, and this slide presents a lifetime use of e-cigarettes among U.S. adults uh, by conventional cigarette smoking status. And these are data from 2010 to 2014 from an online web panel known as Styles, which the CDC adds questions to uh, annually to assess uh, this emerging um, and rapidly uh, diversifying uh, product type. Uh, so you'll see that at the top line is current cigarette smokers, and they comprise the, the majority of uh, lifetime e-cigarette users, um, and then former cigarette smokers as well. Um, you see about half of current uh, cigarette smokers have ever used e-cigarettes. Um, and about 15% of former cigarette smokers have ever used these products. Of note, uh, the a proportion of never smokers who have ever used e-cigarettes has remained fairly uh, static over time. Um, you can see that in this particular figure, there's a, a break between 2013 and 2014, and that's because we changed the question for this measure between those years to address the issue I previously mentioned, um, the, the different types of products and the different terms that are available. So we can't be tell for certain whether this change in 2013 to 2014 was because of the change in the measure or uh, continued increases. Um, but what we do know is that the bulk of people who are using e-cigarettes are current and former cigarette smokers. And now these data are for current use, and we define that as everyday or someday use of e-cigarettes. 
And this is by sex, age, race, ethnicity for 2014. And this is from the National Health Interview Survey, which is a survey that has assessed conventional cigarette smoking back to 1965. Uh, so we first added questions on e-cigarettes in 2014. And as you can see from this, there's about 4% of all U.S. adults have used an e-cigarette uh, every day or some days. So these are what we call current users. Uh, we see some variations, higher rates among men, higher rates among younger adults, and then also by different racial ethnic groups. Uh, for the most part, these variations in use mirror what we're seeing in conventional cigarette smoking patterns. And that's not surprising, because the previous slide showed that most users are, are ever and uh, are current and former cigarette smokers. Um, and so those patterns are very similar for e-cigarettes as well. So one issue that's increasingly important to remember in the, the public health discourse around e-cigarettes and patterns of use is this phenomenon of, of dual use. And that's that people are using both products concurrently. And so some uh, more recent data from the South survey showed that about a quarter, 76.8% of uh, current uh, e-cigarette users are also using conventional cigarettes. Uh, as well. And so this is this issue of dual use, and it's a concern because we know to uh, fully uh, reap the benefits of cessation, you have to quit completely. And even smoking a few cigarettes per day uh, can be dangerous to your health. Um, and so this is important to remember from these cross-sectional data uh, that, that most e-cigarette users are also continuing to use uh, conventional uh, cigarettes as well. Now this data is from uh, youth on the current slide, uh, and this is from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which has been collecting data on e-cigarette use of back since 2011. And what we've seen is marked increases over time and continued increases through 2015. 16% uh, of high school students and 5.3% of middle school students reported uh, using an e-cigarette within the past 30 days. Uh, and so uh, the rates of e-cigarette use among youth, uh, particularly high school students, are higher than among adults, uh, considerably higher. Remember the past 30-day uh, uh, measure here is 16%, and for adults, the uh, everyday or someday use was about a 4%. So ne nearly fourfold higher among youth among adults, which really underscores the importance of evidence-based interventions um, to address e-cigarette use among youth, because any uh, form of tobacco product use among youth, irrespective of whether it's combustible, non-combustible, or electronic, is, is problematic when we're talking about youth. So another issue that comes up frequently uh, with uh, youth patterns of use is, uh, does the use of e-cigarettes lead to conventional cigarette smoking? And these data I presented previously were, were cross-sectional. We just know that a lot of kids are using youth, but they're uh, using e-cigarettes. Uh, but there's an emerging body of science that has uh, assess longitudinally uh, what the relationship is between uh, e-cigarette use and future cigarette smoking. And what we found among the handful of studies that have been released is that kids who use e-cigarettes are more likely to use regular cigarettes in the future. Um, and uh, it's about a three times more likely increase, about to 8.3 times more likely in other studies of uh, adults, uh, young adults as well as adolescents. And so these findings are by no means conclusive. The science is still emerging. But this is one uh, potential component of, of concern about youth use of these products and that those who use these cigarettes may lead uh, to future conventional cigarette smoking in the future. So why are we seeing these marked increases in use, uh, particularly among youth? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One of the most notable is flavors. We know from extensive uh, science for conventional tobacco products that flavors can make these products particularly enticing for youth. And some recent data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey found that about two-thirds of uh, youth tobacco users are reported uh, using a flavored varieties uh, when it comes to e-cigarettes. That was about 1.58 million uh, youth uh, who were using flavored e-cigarettes. And that's comparable to some of the other levels of flavors that we're seeing for other products, including uh, flavored hookah and flavored cigars, which are also presented in this infographic. So we know that a lot of youth are using flavored products, and some recent data from the FDA's population assessment of tobacco or health uh, found that flavors were the primary reason uh, that youth reported using e-cigarettes. So we know this is a, a major influencer for youth to use these products, and that's consistent with the literature documenting this for, for a long time, that flavors can mask the, uh, the harshness of tobacco products and make them more appealing to youth. Another aspect is advertising. We know that e-cigarettes are heavily advertised um, and using a lot of the same tactics for which conventional uh, tobacco products have been advertised for many years, including uh, rebellion, independence, and sex. Um, and they're also being advertised by a variety of different uh, 
resources and, and measures. And so one example of this was a vital signs report that was currently released um, uh, by uh, the CDC that found uh, youth were reported being exposed to e-cigarette advertising in retail stores, the internet, TV, movies, as well as magazines and newspapers. Uh, so it was about 14.4 million were exposed in retail stores, 10.5 million in the internet, a 9.6 through TVs and movies, and 8 uh, million in magazines and newspapers. And about 4 million uh, U.S. Mill and High School students were exposed in all four of these venues. Uh, so we, we know that the advertising is indeed reaching them. Um, and via uh, different uh, mechanisms for which conventional tobacco products have been banned for several decades, such as television, um, where cigarette advertising has been banned since 1971. Uh, so we know that uh, there is uh, certainly a mass media um, that is, is reaching youth, and these self-reported uh, data indicate that uh, the youth are indeed receptive to this advertising. And so it's, it's no surprise that we're seeing corresponding increases in use of these products over the same time period where we're seeing large increases in, in advertising exposure. So in terms of the health effects of these products, um, there, uh, the Surgeon General's report in 2014, the 50th anniversary report, outlined that there could be potential benefits and harms uh, from these products, um, and that uh, has to do with uh, you know the broader population, individual um, uh, impact of these products on uh, conventional uh, cigarette smoking and other patterns of conventional use. Um, so in terms of the harms of these products, there are several. Um, and again, these are theoretical harms, so it's not necessarily that all of these are, are occurring, but they're potential for harm. Um, the first is that the use of e-cigarettes could lead to initiation of combustible tobacco use among non-smokers, particularly children. There's also concerns that they could lead to relapse among former smokers, uh, as well as diminishing the chance that a smoker will quit or discourage smokers from using proven quit methods. And currently, there's no conclusive scientific evidence that e-cigarettes are effective for long-term cessation. Uh, we do know that uh, anecdotally, some people are quitting, and that's a good thing. Um, but the plural of anecdote is in data. And right now, the data, particularly the longitudinal studies that are available, um, do not demonstrate uh, conclusively that these products are effective uh, for cessation. However, we do have seven FDA-approved medications that we know work. Uh, in addition to the concerns over uh, cessation um, and lack of efficacy, there's also uh, the potential to expose bystanders, particularly pregnant women and children, um, from the aerosol from these products, and also the glamorization or renormalization of tobacco use, as well as uh, poisonings among users or non-users. There's been marked upticks in calls to poison control centers uh, regarding e-cigarettes over the past several years, and about 50% of those calls are for children five years of age or younger. So in terms of the harmful, potentially harmful ingredients in e-cigarette aerosol, um, there are uh, multiple studies that have documented uh, potentially hazardous in ingredients, including uh, nicotine, heavy metals, ultrafine particulate matter, uh, volatile organic compounds, as well as other uh, compounds. Um, in many instances, these are lower levels than what you see in conventional cigarette smoke. However, there is still potential um, for uh, public health harm. Um, nicotine it poses a unique danger, particularly to the developing human. Uh, we have sufficient evidence just to, to conclude that nicotine is toxic to developing fetuses and impairs fetal brain and lung development. So the use of these products among pub, uh, pregnant women is particularly concerning. As I mentioned before, there's also uh, increases in poisonings uh, re related to ingestion as well as absorption through the skin and inhalation, particularly among kids. And there's also growing body evidence uh, demonstrating that uh, nicotine exposure uh, may have an adverse effect on the developing adolescent brain. And so youth use of these products is particularly concerning, giving the, the potential to, to harm them uh, well into their uh, adulthood as a result of, of deleterious effects on brain development. And another uh, potential concern from these products is the flavoring. Um, and we know uh, that a lot of these products are using different flavorings, uh, such as diacetyl, which is associated with bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a severe respiratory disease known as popcorn lung. And although there are several uh, flavorings that uh, meet FDA definitions of gross or generally recognized as safe, those standards are for ingestion, not inhalation. Um, so the gut can handle a lot more than the lungs can. Um, and so the inclusion of these flavorings uh, in uh, e-cigarettes is another uh, public health concern. And another important thing to consider is that these products can also be modified to accommodate other psychoactive substances. Uh, so we've seen some data that CDC published here in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine uh, that these products can be used to accommodate uh, cannabis. And among uh, past 30-day marijuana users, about 7.6% reported using uh, 
the uh, marijuana via electronic uh, devices or vaporizers. And some recent data out of Yale uh, showed about 20% uh, of middle school students um, who had used marijuana uh, were reporting uh, using e-cigarette as well. Uh, so there's a large uh, use of uh, other psychoactive substances in, in e-cigarettes beyond just uh, nicotine. So in terms of the harms, we addressed those in the previous slide, but there's also potential benefits for these products, and that's only under certain circumstances, though. And it's important to note that if a, a current cigarette smoker were quit completely uh, and transition exclusively to e-cigarettes, there would be a net public health benefit, um, although that's not necessarily what we're seeing. Um, in the data, we're seeing a lot of dual use. Uh, but, uh, you know, the cigarette smoke contains 7,000 chemicals and 70 carcinogens. So uh, e-cigarette aerosol does not include nearly that amount, um, but safer is not the same as safe. And there's also potentially uh, harms related to exposure to the aerosol because of all the ingredients that I've outlined before. Uh, but the bottom line is that there could be a potential benefit for e-cigarettes if uh, current cigarette smokers were transitioned completely uh, to e-cigarettes and that we didn't have initiation among youth and other vulnerable populations such as pregnant women. So in terms of what can be done to address these products, uh, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act gave the FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products, and they deemed uh, proposed deeming rule was issued in 2014, and it was recently finalized in 2016, and that goes into effect uh, in August of 2016. And so there's a lot of things that can be done to address uh, the, the issue of e-cigarettes to minimize uh, potential harms and maximize potential benefits. But it's also important to note that uh, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act does not uh, preclude states from doing several things related um, to uh, the regulation of uh, uh, e-cigarettes in particular. And some things aren't even under FDA's purview, such as uh, including e-cigarettes and smoke-free laws, um, where conventional cigarette smoking is otherwise prohibited. So in addition to FDA action to regulate the manufacture, sale, and marketing of these products, um, state and local action also has an important uh, component of our, our efforts to uh, minimize potential harms, particularly among youth. And that can include things such as youth access restrictions, including e-cigarettes and smoke-free policies, licensure, as well as pricing strategies. And so those strategies have uh, begun to develop and proliferate at the state and local level um, across the United States. And so with that, these are just the key takeaway points from this uh, presentation. And they're only recently regulated at the federal level, but they're not currently an FDA-approved quit aid. We know that youth and adult use is increasing rapidly, uh, particularly among youth, and rates are now higher among high school students than adults. Uh, for youth, we know that the use of nicotine or tobacco in any form is dangerous, so they should not be using um, e-cigarettes. Uh, but among adults, there could be a potential benefit from these products, but they have to quit smoking cigarettes completely to realize those potential benefits of electronic nicotine delivery systems. Uh, but the bottom line is that well, we do have evidence-based interventions that we know work to effectively address tobacco use, and many of those strategies can be used for e-cigarettes as well. Um, and uh, the most notable of those include things like youth access restrictions and including e-cigarettes and uh, smoke-free laws. And again, the underlying uh, premise of these are to use the precautionary principle for youth to make sure that they don't initiate these products and suffer from a lifelong uh, nicotine addiction or tobacco use, but also to, to minimize potential harms at the broader level. Because uh, the, the, our bottom line for tobacco prevention and control is uh, to reduce combustible tobacco use, which we know is the overwhelming burden of death and disease in this country. But it's important to remember the role that e-cigarettes could play in that in terms of uh, potentially increasing or decreasing um, the uh, use of other conventional tobacco products such as cigarettes. And so with that, here is my contact information. Uh, CDC.gov slash tobacco has multiple resources from CDC on tobacco-related factors as well as e-cigarettes, including fact sheets, infographics, and our most recent up-to-date research from um, our uh, population-based surveys such as the National Youth Tobacco and the National Adult Tobacco Use Survey. So thank you very much for your time. And our last speaker today will be Jerry Voss. Hello, my name is Jerry Voss. I am Supervisory Regulatory Counsel at FDA's Center for Tobacco Products, and I'm going to be speaking today about FDA's regulation of tobacco products and the final deeming rule. The Tobacco Control Act was enacted in 2009, and it gave FDA immediate authority over cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, roll your own, and smoke of tobacco. And it also gave FDA the ability to deem other tobacco products to be subject to the FD&C Act. As a result, FDA issued a proposed deeming rule on April 25, 2014. 
This rule contained two parts. There was a deeming provision, and then there were additional restrictions. We also included scientific evidence to show that those additional restrictions were appropriate for the protection of public health. FDA received over 135,000 comments on this proposed rule. The comments came from all over, from manufacturers, retailers, academia, medical professionals, local governments, advocacy groups, and many consumers. And FDA considered all of the comments received. On May 5th, FDA finalized a rule that deems all tobacco products meeting the statutory definition of a tobacco product, and that includes components or parts, but excludes accessories, to be subject to FDA's tobacco cross authorities. These products include electronic nicotine delivery systems. That includes e-cigarettes, e-cigars, vape pens, and we typically refer to those as end products. All cigars, pipe tobacco, nicotine gels, water pipe or hookah tobacco, dissolvable products not already under the FDA's authority, and future tobacco products that meet the definition of a tobacco product under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The provisions in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that generally apply to tobacco products now apply automatically to these newly regulated products as a result of these as a result of this final deeming rule. These provisions include a requirement to register manufacturing establishments and provide product listings to FDA, a requirement to report ingredients and harmful and potentially harmful constituents, a requirement to go through pre-market review and obtain market authorization of new tobacco products and also a prohibition against selling tobacco products that make modified risk tobacco claims that includes light, lower, mild, unless such claims are authorized by FDA. In addition, as a result of this deeming rule, FDA can now use its authority in Chapter 9 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to issue future reg regulations, such as potentially record retention regulations or product standards that would extend to newly deemed tobacco products. As I mentioned early on, the deeming rule had two parts, the deeming, the deeming provision and additional restrictions. I'm now going to speak about those additional restrictions. First, we added additional restrictions to prevent underage access to these newly deemed tobacco products. And that includes not allowing products to be sold to persons under the age of 18. And that includes both in-person and online a requirement for age verification by a photo ID for anyone under age 27, and also a prohibition against the sale of newly deemed tobacco products in vending machines unless they are in an adult-only facility. These additional restrictions also included health warnings. So by May of 2018, health warnings are going to be required to be displayed on cigarette tobacco, roll your own tobacco, and all newly deemed covered tobacco products. Text warnings on product packages must cover 30% of the principal display panel. And for packages that are too small to carry this warning, these warnings may appear on the outer container or be placed on a tag that's permanently affixed to the product package. For cigars that are sold individually without product packaging, and this may include both premium cigars and other individually sold cigars. All warnings must be placed on a placard near the register. In addition to the requirements for health warnings on product packages, there were also requirements for health warnings on advertisements. And the warning must appear in the upper portion of the area they add and occupy at least 20% of the area of the ad. We required, uh, as a result of the steaming rule, we were requiring one health warning to be on all newly deemed tobacco products and cigarette tobacco and roll your own. This warning is an addiction warning, and it reads, warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. The final rule also includes a self-certification option for covered tobacco products that do not contain nicotine. For these products, the required statement reads, 
this product is made from tobacco. In addition, the final deeming rule also requires six warning statements for cigars, including both cigar packages and advertisements. These must be, the packages and advertisements must bear one of the following, I'm going to start that slide again. There are six warning statements that are required for cigars, including both cigar packages and advertisements, and they must bear one of the following six warning statements according to an FDA-approved warning plan. Cigarette smoke can cause cancers of the mouth and throat, even if you do not inhale. Cigarette smoking can cause lung cancer and heart disease. Cigars are not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Tobacco smoke increases the risk of lung cancer and heart disease, even in non-smokers. Then there is a choice, an option to do one or the other for the reproductive health warning, and that either we cigar use while pregnant can harm you and your baby, or tobacco use increases the risk of infertility, stillbirth, and low birth weight. And like the other newly deemed products, cigars will also be required to carry the warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. The uh, warnings for the cigars must be submitted in accord and, uh, and displayed in accordance with an FDA-approved warning plan. Now I'm going to take a closer look, look at some of the key issues we face in putting together the, the final deeming rule. First, there's the issue of premium cigars. As a result of this final deeming rule, all cigars, including premium cigars, are now deemed to be subject to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. FDA did not find any appropriate public health justification to exclude premium cigars. We, we reviewed all of the available evidence, and the available evidence does not provide a basis to include that the patterns of premium cigar use sufficiently reduce the health risk to warrant exclusion from the steaming rule. Basically, all cigars pose serious negative health risks, even for those that claim they do not inhale. Premium cigars are used by both youth and, and young adults, and all cigars contain harmful and potentially harmful constituents and all scars, regardless of the size, contain nicotine, which is a, an addictive chemical. The second issue I want to highlight here is the pre-market review of newly regulated products. Newly regulated tobacco products are now subject to pre-market review requirements unless they were commercially marketed as of February 15, 2007. That is what FDA refers to as the grandfather date. That date was a statutory date included in the Tobacco Control Act. These products are grandfathered and would not need pre-market review unless the grandfather product has been modified. For newly regulated products on the market as of the effective date of the rule, manufacturers will need to submit applications under staggered timelines. Unless FDA issues an order, denying or refusing to accept those submissions, manufacturers who meet these deadlines will be able to continue to sell their products during the continued compliance period, which is discussed in the preamble to the rule. The product will face enforcement unless it has a marketing order in place at the end of the continued compliance period. The next issue we're going to highlight here today is vape shops. The final rule discusses vape shops, which we, we consider to be tobacco product manufacturers. Basically, establishments that do the following for direct sales to consumers for use in end products, that's electronic nicotine delivery systems, are tobacco products and subject to all of the requirements that apply to manufacturers. And that includes mixing and or preparing combination of e-liquids and or flavors, and they, may, they also may create or modify aerosolizing apparatus. If the vape shops do this, then they are tobacco product manufacturers and subject to the requirements of the Tobacco Control Act that apply to all manufacturers. The next issue is a free sample ban. Under the final deeming rule, the distribution of free samples of newly regulated tobacco products is prohibited. However, 
prospective adult buyers may smell or handle one of the newly regulated tobacco products as long as the free product is not actually consumed either in whole or in part in the retail facility and the prospective buyer doesn't leave the facility with a free tobacco product. FDA notes in the preamble to the final rule that we envision that this could potentially apply both in cigar shops where premium cigars are frequently handled or smelled by consumers prior to purchasing, and this could also apply in a vape shop, again, so long as the product is not actually consumed in the facility and the prospective buyer doesn't leave the facility with a free tobacco product. Effective dates. Generally, the rule is effective um, on the publication date plus 90 days, and that comes out to August 8th, and that applies to the deeming provision as well as uh, the associated automatic provisions, the age restriction, the free sample ban, and the prohibition on the vending machine sales, all of which I have discussed in this presentation. The preamble to the final rule also contains a long list of compliance periods for different requirements, such as submission of a pre-market review application, uh, submission of registration and listing requirements, et cetera. In addition to the final deeming rule, FDA published several different documents that uh, we hope will help manufacturers in their compliance with this rule. The first one was a PMTA draft guidance for electronic nicotine delivery systems. FDA is aware that most end products are going to need to submit a PMTA in order to get a marketing authorization. So that draft guidance, when finalized, will provide FDA's current thinking on what should be included in a PMTA for end products. We also published a final tobacco product master files guidance. FDA expects that master files will be used extensively, uh, particularly among end manufacturers, in order to facilitate the pre-market review product process. We also published a user fee final rule, as well as a small entity compliance guide for user fees. This is for the imposition of, of user fees on both cigars and type tobacco, and we also published a small entity compliance guide for the final deeming rule to assist smaller manufacturers with compliance with this rule. That reaches the end of my presentation. Please feel free to follow us on Twitter at FDA Tobacco or to contact FDA Center for Tobacco Products with any questions. Thank you.